having a seminar for men and another for women is already going against the tide, as I'm sure you have discovered. To treat men as men and women as women is against the tide. We're all neutered persons. But as I told the men yesterday, when I'm criticized for holding all male sessions, I just tell people I'm doing it for the cause of equality. <laughs> there are 28 conferences for women in England to every one conference for men. And I'm just trying to balance up the equality <laughs> of the sexes. Anyway, my more serious comment is that if you are going to go against the tide, you will find yourselves in the painful position of going against the tide inside the church and not just outside. That should never happen, but I'm afraid that is the reality of the situation in which we are. And when you stand firmly for Christ's teaching, you will find that your greatest opponents are within the church. But I believe nevertheless that we must have the courage to go against the tide, if that tide is the tide of our secular humanist age in which we live and move and have our being. Now, I want to go a little further this morning. By the way, how many of you believe that this book is the Word of God? Could I see? That's unanimous. How many of you believe that this is the most important book anyone could ever read? Still unanimous. Pretty well. Third question. How many of you have read it? I didn't say bits of it. I said it. That's all of it from generation to revolution. How many, of, <laughs> how many of you have read it? Now that is nowhere near unanimous. Question number four. How many of you have read any other book right through? <laughs> Once again, we laugh it off. If that is the most important book anyone could ever read, and you've read a lot of other books through, then let me ask you another question, but please be very hesitant about putting your hand up because the Lord will see it. How many of you who have not read it are willing to promise that you will? Now think about it carefully. It's a big book. And if you start today and read three chapters every day and five on Sunday, you'll finish on this date next year. It's a lot of reading. Right, well, the hands went up. It's worth coming to get Christians into the Bible. Because frankly, the relativism of our age will get hold of you unless you are soaked in God's Word. That is the cure against the pressures that are against us. It changes your thinking and it changes your mind from the inside. There is a text in Paul that says, don't be a chameleon, be a caterpillar. I'm sure you can give me the chapter and verse number. It's <laughs> Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And he says, don't be a chameleon, be a caterpillar. Now, a chameleon, you know what that is. If you put it on red, it turns red. If you put it on green, it turns green. If you want to kill a chameleon, you put it on tartan. And um, <laughs> the, the stress explodes it, so I'm told. And Paul said, Paul said in Romans 12 too, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. That's J.B. Phillips' translation, but it's good. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let your mind be metamorphosed from within. That's what happens to the caterpillar, which is a rather ugly creature, turns into a chrysalis, but inside the most beautiful colors are forming, which will become a butterfly. And that's metamorphosis, and that's the actual Greek word that Paul uses. He wants your mind not to pick up the colors of the latest thing you've read in the tabloid press or the latest thing you've seen on TV. He wants it to be colored from the inside, unseen, so that your mind is a mind that is able to prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's just by way of preamble, but I find myself, I've been fighting for 25 years to bring evangelicals and charismatics together. And that battle has uh, come to a climax now with my book, The Fourth Wave, which has just come out. And thank God is already selling by the thousand. And I'm glad people are getting hold of it and reading it. But... Uh, 
Whereas 25 years ago I was trying to persuade evangelicals to be charismatic, I find most of my time today trying to persuade charismatics to be evangelical and to get back to the Word and to really get a solid grasp. This is the only book in the world that will make you wise. All the other books you read make you clever and knowledgeable. This makes you wise. Which would you rather be? Well, you don't make as much money if you're wise. You make more money if you're clever. You have a better career if you're clever. But in the end of the day, a wise person gets to the end of life and can look back with satisfaction. A clever person says, where's it all led? They get to the top and find there's nothing there. But a wise man is someone who makes the most of life has the right answers to the right questions. And that's the book that makes you wise. And what I try to say is this. Listen, I say it almost every time I speak to every group, and I say it to you. If you cannot find what I say in your Bible for yourself, forget it. But if you do find what I say in your Bible, then you can forget me, but don't forget what I've said. Check everything you hear from every Bible teacher and don't follow one Bible teacher. Check everything you hear by the Bible and go constantly back to that and do what the Bereans did. I have the confidence that if I'm preaching what God has said, then I have no vested interest to persuade someone to adopt my opinion. They can check it out. Provided they are open-minded enough to say, what did God actually say? And you're going to get one or two shocks this morning, too. But I want you to go right back to the Bible and see if what I tell you isn't there. And if you don't find it, forget it before it does any damage to you. But if you do find it, then you must have dealings with the Lord. Now, we're talking about salt and light. And as I prepared this talk, I began by thinking, well, now, we want to talk about what salt is and what light is and how they influence the world. And then somehow in my preparation, the whole thing took a different turn. And I was left with what I would call a burden to share with you the cost of being salt and light. Because that's what came home to me most forcibly. That it's going to cost to be different. And that it's going to cost an increasing price. Because the question, well, let's begin like this. There's a world without salt and a world without light. Therefore, it is a world of dirt and disease and darkness. And that's the world in which we live. And we don't belong here. We are strangers passing through. We are aliens. We are misfits. Socially, we misfit. And I'm afraid it's not nice being the odd one out in a group, is it? And one of the biggest pressures on us is to be one of the peers. And youth particularly are under tremendous pressure from peer groups to have sex before marriage. Everybody else does. The pressure of what other people say and think is so enormous that if you're not soaked in this book and living in the spirit, that pressure gets too much. Now, the question comes then, in this world in which we are aliens and strangers, we no longer belong, that's our problem. Is this situation going to get better or worse? Now, we could tackle that regionally and say that in some parts of the world it's going to get better because in Nagaland and in many other third world countries, the number of Christians is increasing rapidly. There's never been such growth in the church in 2,000 years as there is today. But it's not here. But go elsewhere. It's the privilege of some of us to go to the third world. and It's astonishing. It really is. Here are some figures. Between 1982 and the year 2000, the population of Asia and Africa will have trebled, multiplied by three. But over the same period on the present trends, the church will have multiplied by a factor of 35. The church is growing over ten times quicker than the population in Asia and Africa. You're allowed to whisper hallelujah. 
you can get excited. We're not in a church. <laughs> We're in the church. <laughs> but that's exciting. A businessman said to me some years ago, he said, what's your job? I said, well, I'm the pastor of a church. He said, what's it like to belong to a dying organization? <laughs> and I said, I wouldn't know. And uh, he said, but, but he said, churches everywhere are being turned into furniture warehouses and bingo halls. He said, you're on the way out. I said, no, we're not. The church I belong to isn't like that. He said, oh, which church is that? I said, it's the church of Jesus. And I said, every minute I talk to you, there are 45 more Christians in the world than a minute ago, even allowing for deaths. Now, I said, if your business was getting 45 new customers a minute, would you talk about a dying organization? Well, that impressed him. <laughs> See? But then, like Simon Peter, I tried to improve on what I'd said. Do you ever do that? I thought, I've got him. I'll tell him something else. I said, something else, too. The church never loses a single customer by death. I said, we just transfer them to another branch. <laughs> See? And I lost him. And he looked at me as if I was crazy and he walked away. But you see, we belong to the biggest thing in history. And we are now in the fastest growing period of the church. But not here. Because we're not salty enough. And we're not light enough. We're not different enough. But in other countries it costs to be salt and light. And I have noticed that the church under real pressure from outside grows. Satan has never been able to destroy the church from the outside. He knows the only way is to destroy it from the inside. And he's pretty good at that. And he does it by corrupting our beliefs and through that corrupting our behavior so that our standards lower to meet the people instead of using the grace of God to lift the people to meet the standards. Listen, to be the kind of salt and light I had described yesterday, and I was simply expounding the Sermon on the Mount to you, to be that kind of salt and light is supernatural. It is just unnatural. But there's a little word crept in to so many expositions of the Sermon on the Mount today, which is the most damaging word, I believe. It's the word ideal that this presents God's ideal for us. Now, Jesus never used that word. Ideal has about it a kind of unrealistic ring, as if that would be ideal in an ideal world. But we've got to live with reality, and the real world isn't like that. Have you heard this kind of talk? This was the talk in the debate in the Synod about homosexuality. And the motion before the house which clearly stated homosexuality as a sin was changed and the change was that chastity and heterosexuality is God's ideal which has the subtle implication but in a real world you just can't live that way and you've got to lower the standard for a real world the Sermon on the Mount is not Jesus ideal it is his standard for living in a dark, diseased, dirty world. Now, of course, it's unnatural. Of course, nobody can live like that except by supernatural power and grace. And Jesus didn't tease us like a carrot in front of the donkey. He was holding before us the lifestyle of the kingdom here in this world. And he made it very clear that if you live like that, you can expect trouble. I've heard many testimonies from Christians, and I have great difficulty with them. First, because it doesn't match mine, and second, because I can't believe them. And the testimonies that I have trouble with are, I came to Jesus and all my troubles were over. <laughs> have you ever heard that kind of testimony? It's just unreal. It's ideal maybe, but it's unreal. And my testimony is I came to Jesus and my troubles began. And then I got baptized in the Spirit and my troubles got much worse. <laughs> and it is the simple truth that I've been in more trouble in the last five years than in the whole of my previous ministry. That's my simple testimony. 
but it fits Jesus' word better than the other sort. Because he said, in the world you'll have big trouble. But cheer up, I'm on top of it. And I asked a friend not long ago, how are you? He said, I'm very well over the circumstances. <laughs> Only a Christian would say that. Which is precisely where we're meant to be. Over the circumstances. Not under them. Not under pressure, but over pressure. Not under it, but over it. Or to use the biblical term, to be overcomers. Overcomers. In other words, we're in for a battle. And while in some parts of the world it's easier to be a Christian and in other parts it's harder. And we live in one of the places where it is going to be hard. Do you know that the Reader's Digest did an investigation into the most godless nations of the world. The most godless. Now, I can't argue about the way they came to that conclusion, or I could, the questions they asked and so on. But Japan came out at the top. Japan is the least religious country in the world, the most materialistic. And the United Kingdom is second. So we are in the second most godless nation in the world, according to their estimation, and you can quarrel with it, but they asked a number of searching questions. And one of them was how far religion really touched life. So there we have it. That's our environment. And I cannot promise you that it's going to get better in England. I believe it's going to get worse. You've heard already Derek mention the phrase post-Christian world. I want to put another adjective in alongside that. We are now in a post-Constantinian world. And I, I use that advisedly because I believe that accurately describes where we are. Constantine was the first converted Roman emperor in the year 310 A.D., and Christianity became the official religion of the empire. Many hail that as the greatest victory. I think it's the greatest disaster. Because instead of taking the church into the world, it brought the world into the church. And very soon there was persecution of the Jews. And there was law against other religions. That's not the way to establish Christianity. Uh, Sunday, for the first time in the history of the church, became a day of rest. See, for the first 300 years, Sunday was not a day off. If you were a Jew, Saturday was your day off. If you were a Gentile in the Roman Empire, you only got a holiday every tenth day, which didn't coincide with Sunday, except once in a while. And if you were a slave, you didn't have any day off. You worked seven days a week. The church managed without Sunday for 300 years and grew pretty quickly. So, whether we keep Sunday or not is not the big issue. It really isn't. It came in with Constantine, and suddenly he closed the shops on Sunday. He gave everybody a day of rest and insisted everybody turned up at church. And we got into the established state-church relationship, which has prevailed in the whole of Europe ever since until our lifetime. And so we've been accustomed to a society in which Christian standards have been imposed by law. King Alfred, when he wrote the laws of England, he was the first lawmaker in England, down in Winchester. When he wrote them, he wrote the Ten Commandments before he wrote any others. And this has been built into the Constantinian thing we call Christendom, which is a strange mixture of the world and the church. And... Uh, incidentally led to treating every baby born as a member of the state and the church simultaneously. And the implications for baptism, I leave you to work out. But all this, the reformers, the Protestant reformers, did not change that. Even though they rediscovered the Bible, they replaced the authority of the church with the authority of the state. And whole areas were forcibly and legally change from Catholic to Protestant, a situation that still applies in Switzerland, where I'll be preaching later this year 
on the annual service to celebrate the Reformation in Switzerland. And I've given them my title, which is Completing the Reformation, which is not going to be the most popular theme for them. <laughs> and uh, in two weeks' time in Switzerland, those who have organized the service want to meet me first. So <laughs> <laughs> that may be another. Unfortunately, arrangements have fallen through, but we'll see. But you see, the Reformation was never completed and too many Christians are still back in the Reformed thinking. But it never split church and state because Europe became Protestant in the northern half through act of parliament virtually. The state imposed it. And suddenly now, free churchmen were per persecuted by Protestants where they'd been persecuted by Catholics. The Anabaptists, the left wing of the Reformation. You can read all about it. But what is now breaking down in our situation is that this church-state liaison is breaking right down. Whether we like it or not, whether we're sad about it or not, we may fight to try and keep Sunday in the legislation, but the battle is lost. And I don't want to refight it, quite frankly. Some do, but uh, until we got a much larger percentage of genuine Christians back into society, it's highly unlikely that legislation is going to stop the rot. Do you follow me? It's just a rearguard action that we're fighting on the legislative front. But because the church-state relationship has now broken down, and I believe will never be re-established, one or two African states are trying to get back to that, very interesting, um, Zambia is one, uh, they're just trying to get back to a church state that is Christian, but those days have gone. In other words, what I'm saying is, we are rapidly going back to the first three centuries of the church. We are going to have to learn from them how to cope with a world that is pagan all around us, and that is rapidly losing all Christian character. You follow me? And yet during those first 300 years, the church grew and it spread rapidly. But the cost was very much greater. Now when I used to go behind the Iron Curtain, as it was, it's down now, now, now when I go and speak to the pastors of East Germany, they bewail the collapse of communism. To hear 120 pastors say, let's have Hanukkah back. Our task was much easier when the church was opposed. Now the materialism of the West is wrecking our young people. That's what they're saying. And if you go to China today, you find the same thing. The church is growing, not just in quantity, but in quality. And persecution has always strengthened the church and made it strong. Because there's no sitting on the fence. There's no compromise. You're either right in, you're right out. When it costs. I heard years ago of a prayer meeting in Russia where two Russian soldiers burst into the prayer meeting with Kalashnikov machine guns. And they said, we're going to kill you Christians. And they thought they were drunk on vodka and then realized they were perfectly sober. And then the two soldiers said, and if you're not Christians, get out. And a number got up and ran. And then the soldiers said to the rest, would you now tell us please how to become Christians? <laughs> but we had to make sure of you first. What would happen to your church prayer meeting? <laughs> because it's coming. If there's one promise that Jesus made or prediction, he said, that before the end comes, you will be hated by all nations. All, not some. At the moment, out of about 250 national states, the church is under pressure in well over 200. Some would say about 220, which leaves about 30 where we are able freely to worship without the secret police taking down what we say or without risking our business or our family to belong to Jesus. Do you know how many people died for Christ last year? If I said 3,000, what would you feel? 
If I said 30,000, you'd think I was exaggerating. If I said 300,000, what would you feel? Well, the last figure is over the top. It was 264,000. If you want to know where it's happening, just go and study what's happening in Sudan. Now, I want Sudan. I want to speak this morning about martyrdom. What a strange subject to take to a bunch of comfortable Christians in Kinlaw Hall. But you see, in Scripture, the word witness and the word martyr are exactly the same thing. Because we're not only called to a Christian way of life, but a Christian way of death. And to take up your cross daily involves death. To die in principle. To learn how to die. To die for what you believe to be true and right. To die for Jesus. Now, it'd be nice if we could get it all over in one fell swoop and go to the lines this morning and just finish with it. The daily death is a good deal more uncomfortable. But it's going to happen. You see, the Bible leaves us with no doubts about the future. People who read their horoscopes daily, they're barking up the wrong tree. Horoscopes have never been more than 5% accurate. Which is another way of saying they've always been 95% wrong. But people always remember the 5%. And uh, Scientology or science, scientific futurology is now a study. There are pro professorial chairs in futurology and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology has worked out that the world will end in 2050. And many studies have come up with that date by calculating the population growth, the energy reserves, the food reserves, and so on. That unless we can either reduce the population growth or find new sources of energy or food, then the crossover point at which life becomes impossible on planet Earth is 2050. And because of all this, there's a panic about preserving planet Earth, a panic that is rapidly changing into a religion. The green movement is becoming one of the greatest religious challenges to Christianity. And it is a religion and Mother Nature is replacing Father God. And we must propitiate her because our life depends on her and her life depends on us. So we are in a mutual symbiotic relationship with Mother Nature. That is a lie. My future and Mother Nature's future and she's a lady that doesn't even exist, depends on Father God. And we are the only people in the world who know there's going to be a new planet Earth, that this is not the only planet we'll ever have to live on. We're the only ones who know that, which is why we don't panic, even though we are concerned about the exploitation and abuse of that which was given to us as stewards. But you see, we know the future. And this book is full of prediction about the future. 27% of the verses of this Bible contain a prediction. And of those, when you add up how many different future events are predicted, the answer is 735. And if you ask how many of those have already happened, the answer is 596 or 81% which doesn't mean the Bible's 81% accurate because most of the other predictions are about the end of the world and obviously that hasn't happened yet, but it will. And the Bible has been 100% accurate thus far in its predictions and so we are told the future. And apart from regional variations, where in some cases there are a lot of Christians and it's easier to be a Christian, always hits me when I go to America that people are quite unembarrassed to talk about their church that they go to. Here we are. Religion, politics, the two things you don't mention in polite society, but in America, quite happy a taxi driver will talk about church and the Bible because 60% of the people of America claim to be born again. And the numbers help it to be acceptable. Uh, we can have our own questions about that figure. But um, it's a different situation. When I went to South India last year, I went to Tamil Nadu. That's a state right at the south in the tip. Uh, Madras is the capital. And the atmosphere in, in Tamil Nadu is quite different from other states in India. 
Uh, people are more courteous. There's less vice and crime. Uh, personal relationships, personal honesty is higher than any other state. It's just different. It's more Christian. There's more salt and light there. And so I asked the Indians, why is it that this state is so much more Christian than other states? I said, well, was it due to some great move of the Spirit, some great revival, or did you have a great missionary here who did it? And they said, oh, it was a great missionary. And they said, that man is responsible for this whole situation in Tamil Nadu. And I, I said, oh, I, tell me about him. They said, we'll take you to see his grave tomorrow. And on the way, we'll show you the hill where he preached his last sermon. Well, all this got me really interested because I love studying history. And uh, so we went to see the hill and the grave. Do you know whose it was? Thomas. Doubting Thomas. The Thomas. And they talked to him as if he'd only died yesterday. With such affection. And there is still an ancient denomination in South India called the Martoma Church. Church of Thomas. It says due to that man. But he produced enough salt and light. And I could feel the benefit of his ministry 2,000 years later. <laughs> Boy. And so it's much easier being a Christian in Tamil Nadu than anywhere else. So there are two migrations of Christians in, in India. There are Christians moving into Tamil Nadu because it's easier. And there are Christians going out from Tamil Nadu who say the other states are in great need. Uh, we want to take the salt and light where it's needed. Very interesting. And I was speaking to five or six hundred Indian workers who were all moving out of Tamil Nadu to go and take the salt and light where it was needed in the Orissa Hills and elsewhere. And you know, they listened to teaching not for one hour in the morning. They listened to the same teacher from morning at 10 o'clock till about 7 at night. And then they had to do their revision because every morning between 9 and 10 they had a written exam on what I taught the day before. <laughs> and I got the impression that not only did they want to be tested on it to prove that they'd learned what I'd given, but they were raring to go and tell the rest of India what they'd learned. And for one week, I'm teaching them about the kingdom of God. And they were just longing to spread the gospel of the kingdom. It was exciting. Well, let's take the predictions of the Bible. And overall, taking the situation globally and biblically, then the Bible predicts that the situation is going to get worse, not better. That it's going to get tougher for salt and light, not easier. And that as the kingdom of God gets strong, and the promise is that it will get stronger toward the end of history, so the kingdom of Satan is also getting stronger. See, I find there are three sorts of Christians today, optimists, pessimists, and realists. Let's begin with the pessimists, mainly older Christians. We're in the last days. It's going to be a great falling away. Don't know how many there'll be left when Jesus gets back. Maybe only you and me. <laughs> and I'm not even sure if you're sound. <laughs> now, I'm sure you've met people like this. Mainly older Christians in tiny fellowships. And so they put on the spectacles of their parochial situation, read the whole situation as if it's like that. They should just go to one church in India. We'll cure them of their pessimism. At the other end are the young people, the optimists. We're going to march for Jesus. We're going to drive Satan out of England. He can go to France, but we're going to clean the situation. <laughs> you know? We're going to rule the nations now. We are taking over the world for Jesus. Now listen, you laugh, and I'm caricaturing, but dominion theology and reconstruction theology is precisely that. That the church is going to establish the kingdom worldwide. That's optimism. And there's nothing more disillusioning than hopes that are disappointed. I believe many Christians in England, I find, are suffering from disillusionment. Thought the kingdom was just around the corner and England was going to be Christian. They're now praying for a revival where they thought the kingdom was coming. I see no signs of revival in England. And I think that is not the answer. We need to prepare for tougher times. 
It's not going to get better, it's going to get worse. I want to highlight two books in the New Testament which are going to prepare you for what's coming. Because if you think it's hard now, I'm sorry, but I have to say you ain't seen nothing yet. You have not yet resisted to blood. And that's a quote from one of the books, The Letter to the Hebrews. Now, I've done a series of videos that threw in the porch there in the main hall, and it was uh, Jim Harris who made those possible. They're really catching on. It's a new approach to Bible study, and they're being used on 15 cable television networks now in this country, which is the first time I think Bible study really has got on. Uh, but they're being used widely in house groups, and the main thrust of those videos is that the, the context for every statement in the Bible is the book in which it occurs. That is the first major context you need to look at. And you need to have the key in your hand, why was that book written? And once you've got the answer to that question, that key will unlock everything in that book. Why was this book written? I told you yesterday that two of the Gospels were written for unbelievers and two for believers. Once you realize that, you don't give the wrong Gospel to the wrong person. Uh, and Matthew, as I said, was written as a manual for new converts, a manual of discipleship. John was written for mature Christians to keep them believing and to keep them sound in their doctrine of the person of Christ. It is not written to evangelize with. It's only John 3.16 that really is useful in evangelism. But uh, John 1 is a real headache for Christians, never mind unbelievers. In the beginning was the Word. But uh, you see, you must start with the book. Now, the two books that I want to just introduce you to this morning, which I want you to soak yourselves in to prepare for the future, are the letter to the Hebrews and the book of Revelation. Both those books are going to come into their own. And both books, many Christians are not comfortable with or find a bit difficult. So let me take them and show how in their context in history they were perfectly adapted and written for Christians facing increasing pressure as a world became increasingly hostile. You see, people ask me, how do you read the scene in England? And again, I keep stressing that England's the one I know best. And I answer, apathy is giving way to hostility. And hostility is far easier to evangelize. Now, the flesh doesn't welcome this hostility, but the spirit does. It's going to be the saving of the church. But you see, we've battled for decades with people who couldn't care less about who we are or what we believe. That is changing. And it's giving way to hostility. Hallelujah for that. There's no such thing as bad publicity. It's better to be noticed and criticized than ignored. But we've been ignored for too long. And now the hostility is coming. I remember going to a youth club once, and my wife, as she usually does when I got home, she said, how did you get on? I said, well, there were 30 there, and there's hope for two of them. She said, why just two? I said, two of them were so angry with me, there were tears in their eyes. They argued and argued and fought me with tears in their eyes. The rest just sat and looked at me. So I said, there's hope for two. And those two were baptized within six months. <laughs> but none of the others were. You see, when Jesus said you will be hated by all nations, he then went on to say the next thing will happen is that nominal Christians will leave and the love of many will grow cold. And of course, when the pressure's on, when you're hated for being a Christian, you can't be a nominal one. You can't be a compromiser. You're finished. But real Christians come out. And then the very next sentence says, is this, and the gospel will be preached to all the nations. In other words, there's a threefold step here. The church under persecution, the nominal Christians leaving, and the church finishing the job. See, the pressure purifies the church and equips it to get on with the evangelism. That's what's happening in China right now. Church is growing faster there than any other country I know. Because those three steps are all happening. And nominal, compromised Christians no longer exist. You're either right in 
or you're right out. And then the difference is so apparent that the salt and light can operate and evangelism can take place. So the letter to the Hebrews was written during the reign of Nero, early in the reign of Nero, to the Christians in Italy and particularly in Rome. And the stage they were at, by the way, the whole letter is written to believers. Everything in the letter is addressed to believers. It is not to unbelievers. It's to Christians, but it's to Hebrew believers, particularly them. Now, why? Because in the beginning of Nero's reign, persecution had started. That's when it really began. And Christians became unpopular for the first time in Rome. And so they were attacked, but not to the point of martyrdom. Their property was attacked. Their reputation was attacked. The worst was some of them were put in prison. But nobody died for the faith in those early years of Nero. And the letter of the Hebrews mentions all this. It says you've suffered the attack on your property. You, some of you have been in prison, but you have not yet resisted to blood. Nobody has yet died for their faith. But that's where you are. You're at the beginning of the pressure. Now, to Hebrew believers, there was an escape from the pressure. The escape was due to the fact that Christianity was an illegal religion, a religio illicita, which was outlawed, whereas Judaism was a legal registered religion a religio licita. And therefore, the simple way for Jewish believers to escape persecution was to go back to the synagogue and be a secret believer in Jesus within the synagogue and worship the same God and be part of a registered religion instead of an unregistered. That's the background to Hebrews. The only snag was that they would not be accepted back into the synagogue until they stood up in the synagogue and made an open statement that they no longer believed Jesus was the Christ. But all they need say was that little word, Jesus is not the Christ, and they would be accepted back and their families and their property and everything would be safe and they could still worship the same God because the Father of Jesus is the God of Israel. And everything would be hunky-dory. Now, Gentile believers didn't have that escape route. Only Hebrew believers had that escape route. And the whole letter is written to say, don't do it. Don't go back. Go on with Jesus. And the whole letter, the purpose of the whole letter is to stop them running away from the pressure and to encourage them to stay with it and to go on with Jesus. Now he uses every argument he can think of. He says if you're going back to Judaism, I'm paraphrasing, it's like going from a Rolls Royce to a Ford Model T. You're going from the Son of God to his servants. You're going back to angels. You're going back to the apostles Moses and Joshua. You're going back to priests. You're going back to sacrifices. And you're leaving Jesus the Son who has made one sacrifice for all your sins. That's what you're doing. And he appeals in that first section to the sheer contrast between the shadows and the substance. You're giving up the substance for the shadows. You've got the sun and you're going back to angels. You're going back to apostles. You're going back to humans. You've got the very sun. But scattered through the whole letter are constant appeals and warnings. Don't neglect your salvation. Don't drift away from the assembly. Don't stop meeting with the other Christians. Don't lose your confidence in what you have. Press on. And then he throws at them the Old Testament saints who lived for what they never saw but pressed on and paid the cost for it paid the price. And uh, I was once in company of a prosperity preacher and I was asked to speak alongside him and I read Hebrews. By faith they lived in caves. By faith they were destitute. By faith they were sawn asunder. I said faith doesn't give you a Rolls Royce. It gives you a cave to live in. 
of whom the world was not worthy. And one verse in Hebrews 11 thrills me. It's a verse right in the middle of chapter 11. It says, all these were still living by faith when they died. And they never saw it. But they suffered for it. They suffered for something they never saw. What an appeal he makes. But then comes a series of warnings that they can lose their salvation. And the most serious warning of all in Hebrews 6 says, and if you do lose it, there's no way you can get it back again. I think that's probably the most serious thing in the whole letter. If you lose it, there's no repentance possible. It's not possible to find your way back. Please, don't go back. Go on. Go on. And he says suffering is normal for the Christian. If you didn't suffer for Jesus, you'd be a bastard. You wouldn't be a son. Because it's the mark of a child that a child is disciplined by its parents. Whom the Lord loves, he chastises. He says, see your suffering in that light. He's doing it for your good. For your good. The whole letter, read it. It puts iron in your soul. It says, Lord, I don't want to go back. I want to go on. Whatever it costs. And I don't want to lose the salvation you've given me. Now, these people had not yet died for their faith. But they were suffering. In property, their family was suffering. They were even being put in prison, which is why the letter says at the end, don't forget those who are in prison. Keep hold of them too. Visit them. And uh, a very important point when you're under that kind of pressure is mutual hospitality. Very important. Open your home to the people. By the way, angels never appear with wings and a harp and a long white nightdress. I ask you, how could you entertain someone like that unawares? <laughs> when angels appear, they appear as normal human beings. You probably had one in your car. I've got a lovely recording at home of angels singing. You've never heard music like it. They're real. And thank God for them. This is a sidetrack, but a girl told me recently she was walking home alone from a church meeting through the dark streets of one of our big cities and a young man leapt out of the shadows and started tearing her blouse off. And she just cried out to the Lord of hosts. She doesn't know why she said that. But Lord of hosts. And a young man came around the corner and knocked this other young man into the gutter and took her arm and said, come on, Helen, I'll see you home. And took her to her front door and she opened the door with a key and turned around to thank him and the street was empty. And she said to me, was that an angel? <laughs> <laughs> was so unused to the thought that she even questioned it. Was that an angel? I said, why are you asking? The Lord of hosts is the Lord of angels. And we've got them. But we don't put our eyes on them. We fix our eyes on Jesus. Who endured the cross and despised the shame? You see, the cross for Jesus began with shame. It began with ridicule. It began with humiliation. It finished in pain and death. But it began in humiliation, in ridicule. That's where it usually begins for us too. Take up your cross daily. It's, it's hurtful to be laughed at, isn't it? To made, be made the subject of a joke. It hurts. But that's where the cross comes. Oh, you're not one of those narrow-minded fundamentalists, are you? Have you noticed how the word fundamentalist, which originally meant someone who believed all the fundamentals of the faith, has become now a term of abuse? It's become a term of abuse. Oh, these fundamentalists. Because you believe the word of God. Let them laugh. Pity them. Because Jesus says, whatever you do to one of my brethren, you're doing it to me. And you can leave him to repay. You never need to take vengeance. I will repay, says the Lord. Leave it in his hands. So Hebrews strengthens you. It gets you, fix your eyes on Jesus, who for the shame and for the suffering, but for the joy set before him, went through it all. And this is where the future dimension is so important. 
And this is why I've made a video on the final facts and why I'm writing a book on the second coming right now. It is because I think we've forgotten the future dimension. We have become so preoccupied with the present and our sufferings and our problems and everything else we're going through now that we've forgotten the joy that's set before us. What a future. It's all there. And what we're going through now is a momentary light affliction compared with the eternal weight of glory on there. But if we're not thinking about the second coming, if we're not thinking about the future, then frankly, we're, we'll be overwhelmed with the present. Why should a Christian have to go through all this? Why should I suffer like this? Why am I in such stress? Now, it's a momentary light affliction. If you think about the glory that's set before you. But if you lose faith in a future world, which the world hasn't got, that's why they're desperate to save planet Earth, because they, apart from that, they've no future to look forward to. If you think of your future, you can put up with a bit of suffering in the present. You can even rejoice that you're worthy to suffer. It's a proof that you're a real Christian. It's not a problem. It's a proof. The Lord is treating you as a son or a daughter by letting you go through it. Hallelujah. It wasn't terribly spontaneous, but never mind, we'll carry on. <laughs> Let's look at the book of Revelation. That is written 30 years later in the reign of Domitian, the emperor. Now, many Christians tell me the book of Revelation is a complete puzzle to them. As one man said, it either finds you crazy or it leaves you crazy. <laughs> and most Christians leave it alone because they think they'll never understand it. But really, I think it's one of the simplest books in the New Testament. Once you've got the key to unlock it. And the key is very simple. It's written for Christian suffering and facing martyrdom. In fact, martyrs are prominent all the way through. At one stage, it almost looks as if only martyrs will be in heaven. That's your first impression if you don't read it too carefully. It's written for Christians who are now facing a far worse situation than at the reign of Nero at the beginning. Because Domitian, around the year AD 90, 30 years later, was the first emperor to demand emperor worship. And once a year, every citizen of the empire had to worship the emperor and say the three words, Caesar is Lord. And Christians absolutely refused to say that. They said Jesus is Lord. And for three words, people died. There was a young mother with a baby, newborn baby, and they took her, put her in prison in one cell, and put the baby in the next cell. She could hear the baby crying for milk. And they said to the mother, as soon as you say the three words, Caesar is Lord, you can feed your baby. And she refused. Gradually the baby's cries became softer and died away. The baby died. She still refused. Three words. But she said, that compromises my faith. Jesus is Lord. And they took that girl and they lit a fire and put a steel sheet on top, an iron sheet, until it was red hot. And then they fried her alive. And she died. That's how the church grew. That was the kind of Christians they had then. And Revelation was written in the middle of that. Now, that day in which everybody had to say those three words and worship the emperor of Rome, that day was called the Lord's Day. It's a very interesting thing. That phrase was taken over by Christians from the emperor. emperor. Normally, the Christians just call it the first day of the week or even the eighth day, but... This is the only situation in the New Testament where this phrase, the Lord's Day, comes. And John was already in prison for Jesus, for no other crime than the testimony of Jesus. And he's in the spirit, in the prison, on the Lord's Day. And John realized that Christians now faced martyrdom on a wide scale. And he thought, how can I prepare the Christians for martyrdom to be overcomers, to be faithful unto death? 
That doesn't mean faithful until death, but unto death. Do you get the difference? So many funerals quote that, faithful, this person has been faithful unto death. No, they haven't. They've died naturally. To be faithful unto death is to be a martyr, a witness for Jesus to the last step on the road. And so everything in the book of Revelation is written to encourage, which means to put courage into the people who are now under this colossal pressure, the imperial day. It may have been Sunday as well. It may have been both. But the primary reference of the Lord's day, I was in the spirit on the imperial day when everybody had to say these. And his heart, he's shut off from his people. He can't stand with them and refuse to say Caesar is Lord. And he knows they're going to die if they don't say it. So he writes this book. It's a book for people facing martyrdom. That's why we don't understand it. Because we're not in the right position to read it. And his message is very simple. You know, there are a group of theological students in America and they had lectures on apocalyptic books of the Bible, including Revelation. Horrible word that, isn't it? Apocalyptic. And uh, they were confused at the end of the lecture, so they decided to have a game of baseball. Oh, sorry, basketball. And they went to the gymnasium of the campus and uh, were playing basketball and they noticed that a black man who was the janitor, the caretaker of the building, was sitting at the side of the court waiting to lock up. But he was reading his Bible. And they went over to him and they said, uh, reading your Bible, good to see you reading your Bible. What are you reading? He said, Revelation. They said, you don't understand that, do you? He said, of course I do. <laughs> and they said, what's the message? He said, simple, Jesus wins. <laughs> Now, that, that is, that's the overall theme. And it presents Jesus not as prophet, as the four Gospels do, or even as priest, as Hebrews does, but as king. And we need revelation for a full picture of Jesus. Jesus wins. But I'll give you a simple outline of revelation that's a little more complex than that, but very simple. The book divides into two halves. And the title of the first half is, Things are going to get much worse before they get better. The title of the second half is Things Are Going to Get Much Better After They Get Worse. <laughs> and that is the summary of the book. And all the way through it's overcomers, overcomers. And while you might get the impression in certain points of the book that only martyrs will be in heaven, you read carefully, and it's a little wider than that, but I want to say something now that will be a shock to you. It is only overcomers. Who survive. Overcomers. Whether they overcome by martyrdom or by remaining alive and suffering for Jesus. And Jesus says, He who overcomes, I will not erase his name from the book of life. If language means anything at all, he is saying those who don't overcome, their names can be rubbed out of the book of life. That is serious, because on the last day, it's only those whose names are in that book who go into the new heaven and the new earth, those who have remained firm. And that is why the first section of the book is to get the churches put right. The very first step to get ready for worse times coming is to get the church right. And every church is somewhere reflected in those seven churches in Asia. And the first thing is, the first thing is to get the people of God ready for suffering by getting them right, by getting their beliefs right and their behavior right, by getting rid of compromise in the church, yes, adultery in the church, by getting these things out. Because the one thing that you need to prepare to suffer for Jesus is holiness. Now, I have it on good authority that a private detective agency in London has been paid to compile a private dossier on the lives of every leading Christian in this country so that they can be shot down in flames. How do you get ready for persecution? We had the subject last night, holiness. Otherwise you're vulnerable. You can be shot down. It can be pointed at you, how can they be a Christian? They don't live by Jesus' teaching. It's been put in a more jocular way. If you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? You've heard that. 
But the, that's the thing. So that the book of Revelation is going to come into its own. I find increasing attention being given to it to prepare God's people to be faithful until death. Ultimately, witness leads to that. How do you prepare for that? And listen, 264,000 in many, many countries have been dying for Jesus. I once said to a dear saint whom I know, Bob, I don't think I could die for Jesus. I don't think I could face the lions for him. I was in my 20s when I said it. I'll never forget what he said. He said, David... If you are faithful in little things now, he'll give you grace when the big crunch comes. And slowly I've learned to be a little more courageous about standing for what is right and true. But it costs. In other words, you begin your martyrdom now. Witness is martyrdom. You die to yourself. You die to your reputation. You die to your relationships. Because you lose friends when you stand for what is right. But learn to die now. And if the great test comes before you die, then uh, you'll stand. But if you're faithless in little things, if you're ashamed of the Lord now, Jesus said, if you deny me now, I will deny you then. I can't acknowledge you if you haven't acknowledged me. We're talking about serious things. Yes, I do believe, if you ask me straight out, I do believe you can lose your salvation. Hebrews is full of warnings. So is Revelation. But so is Jesus' teaching. He said, I am the true vine. You are the branches. Stay in me. Abide in me. If you abide in me, you'll have much fruit. But if you don't stay in me, you're cut out and burned. Paul says the same thing. He said, don't boast because the Jews were cut out and you were grafted in. You too will be cut off unless you... Continue in his kindness. There's a going on believing that is necessary. It is he that endures to the end who shall be saved. And Jesus said that in the context of increasing pressure. But look ahead beyond that. A new heaven and a new earth. Do you know some Christians will never see heaven at all. Those who die now go to heaven to be with Jesus, but it's only a temporary waiting room because when Jesus comes back to earth, we come back to earth. Did you realize that? We're all coming back to earth with him. And earth is our future destiny. The old earth first, we're going to reign with him. That to me gives point to all my daily life, to my work. We're going to be the government. We're going to reign with him. Paul says to the Corinthians, how dare you take each other to law when you are going to run the law courts? And judge the nations. See, God's going to need doctors, judges, bankers when Jesus comes back. We're going to be running the world and letting the world see what it can be like when Jesus is king and Satan is banished. We're going to see that. But beyond even that, Jesus and his people reigning over this earth, there's a new earth coming. And the most glorious news at the end of the Bible, at the end of Revelation, is this. God's moving house. He is moving in with us here. That is the amazing climax of the scripture. It is not that we're going to heaven to live with God forever. He's moving to earth to live with us forever. And the angels are amazed. They say, behold, look. Or in Welsh, look you. <laughs> the, the, dwelling, the dwelling place of God is with men. Not the dwelling place of men is with God, but the dwelling place of God is with men. And he will be their God and they will be his people. The Holy Spirit's been here and the Son has been here. And in fact, at the beginning of the Bible, God was here too, walking in the Garden of Eden. And at the end of the Bible, he moves back in. And the gap between heaven and earth closes. And the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven and is the dwelling place of God with his people forevermore. A new earth. And if we are overcomers, we will be part of that. Alas, there will be believers who have not overcome and who will not be part of it. That's the message of the book of Revelation. It's to strengthen you to keep your name in the book of life, to overcome so that you may share in the new earth. It's very interesting that on the last page there's a list of those who are thrown out and live outside that new earth in the lake of fire. And the first type of people mentioned 
are not adulterers or liars or murderers. The very first group mentioned are the cowards. The cowards. Those who caved in and were more afraid of men than of God. Well, that was my prophetic burden, I believe, that God gave me. I was just asked to speak on salt and light. And the thing just took off in this direction, that it's going to be increasingly costly to be salt and to be light and to face the pressures of a world that's going the other way, a broad way that doesn't lead to life. We're on a narrow way and we're going to be called narrow-minded. And we're going to be called unsympathetic and we're going to be called inhuman because we don't go along with where people are going. But we're heading for heaven and earth, a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for your honesty. You said, see, I have told you all these things before they happen, so that your heart will not be troubled. I want to thank you that you've told us the bad news as well as the good news, and that you've never called us to go anywhere that you haven't been first. And Lord, they hated you and they put your light out, and the earth was in total darkness for three hours. Now you've called us to shine. Lord, I pray, have mercy on us. Make us that holy people. May we be faithful, even unto death, if that's what it'll cost. But teach us to take up our cross daily, gladly, for the joy that is set before us, for the privilege and the honor of living with you in a new world where there be no sin and no sorrow, no sickness, just you and us forever. Lord, I pray that this word may be a word of preparation for everyone who's heard it, that when the tough time comes, they may rejoice that they're worthy to suffer and gladly do it for your sake in the Gospels, for your name's sake. Amen.